so I want to try my reconstruction video again. The first one I did, I apparently was missing some of my notes. So I'm going to do this a second time. All right, so here we go. Reconstruction is going to be part of time period five. I'm going to throw in a little tidbit here from the New South because the New South is actually a little bit of time period six, but it fits here with the Reconstruction lecture. So I'm going to do this as fast as possible. The end of the war. The smoke of the cannons had cleared and destruction was revealed. Devastation is totally economic, political, social. Make sure that you put in your mind that year, 1865, end of the Civil War. Reconstruction is actually going to last until 1877 on paper. Now, there are a few big questions to look at. What's the place in society now for African Americans who have nothing? They have freedom but they don't have any resources. They don't have any skills. And what's the government's responsibility to them? And how does the South rebuild its shattered economy and society? And did the South really secede? Important questions. Lincoln believed he achieved his two goals. Number one, the union was preserved. Number two, the slaves are free. So during the war, Congress centralized national power and enacted the Republican economic agenda. Some key things that are going to happen war. One, they passed the Merrill Tariff Act, which doubled the national level of import duties. Good for the North. Number two, the National Banking Act created a uniform system of banking and banknotes. Good for the North. Number three, they passed legislation to build the first transcontinental railroad. Within 10 years, we have four major trunk lines. This was passed in 1862 and leads to that uh, stake being driven in at Promontory Point, Utah. Uh, the next thing they're going to do, number five, is the Homestead Act in 1862, 160 acres for basically free, very minimal cost to settlers who had to only occupy and live there for five years. And last but not least, the Merrill Land Grant Act gave each state 30,000 acres of federal land per member of Congress from the state, which helps to fund A&M colleges. That's a lot of land. So the post-war South, where are we now? Well, Sherman left a trail of ruin. Property values had collapsed. Confederate bonds and paper money were worthless. The railroads were damaged or destroyed. The federal government, um, sorry, the federal government uh, had either seized all of the cotton or destroyed it. And so to add to this, the cotton market will not recover until 1879. Uh, tobacco doesn't recover until 1893. Four billion dollars that had been invested in slaves by these people was gone. There was no eminent domain here. That term property has been thrown out because of the session. And so that's a good thing. The rise of the tidewater and the help of the industries of Kentucky are never going to regain their pre-war status. Southern society is doomed. Many planters were left destitute and homeless. Some former Confederates left the South rather than submit to the Yankee rule. They moved to Canada, Europe. Mexico, South America, or Asia. You know how every election people say, if that person gets elected, I'm moving to such and such. Well, these people actually did it. Union troops in the South uh, were sent to impose order and were cursed and spat upon. Southern nationalists implanted in their children a hatred of Yankees and a defiance of Northern rule at all costs. One mother said she trained her children to fear God, love the South, and live to avenge her. Newly freed slaves were dependent. They had no money, property, or friends that had resources. The talk of land led to rumors of 40 acres and a mule. Instead of real help, slaves got advice about proper behavior. The Freedmen's Bureau is perhaps the better group to help slaves at this time, but they're going to have their hands tied, basically. They were set up in 1865 to deal with things like provisions, clothing, and fuel. They were entrusted with helping slaves negotiate labor, excuse me, helping newly freed men negotiate labor contracts so that they would not be cheated in these labor contracts. They had their own courts. They were not given power, though, to protect and assist former slaves from the intensive racial prejudice that existed at this time. So you kind of give them all these things to do, but you cut their hands off. They're going to have their probably biggest accomplishment in teaching five 100,000 African Americans to read. Lincoln's proclamation of amnesty and reconstruction was pretty simple. He did this not long after writing the Emancipation Proclamation. And so in 1864, he writes this proclamation and it basically said any rebel slave could rejoin the government whenever a number equal to 10% of those who voted in 1860 took an oath of allegiance and received a presidential pardon. 
certain groups were excluded, like members of the Confederate government, particularly, and military. Lincoln and Congress, politicians disagreed as to where the authority rested. Lincoln claimed the right to direct Reconstruction as part of his presidential power to grant pardons, but Republican congressmen thought this right should belong to them. Radical Republicans. Republicans favored a sweeping transformation of Southern society based upon granting freed slaves full-fledged citizenship. Now, they're called radical because at that time, that was very radical. When we look at it today, it seems reasonable. In 1864, the Way davis Bill, which required that the majority of white males, 50% plus one, declare their allegiance. State conventions would have to abolish slavery. This never came law in 1864, the Way davis Bill did not, because Lincoln actually vetoes it. The reason he vetoed it is he felt that the 50% number was too high for some of the reasons that we talked about in class. 10% was perhaps too low, but 50% was too high, and those people had to have never been in the Confederacy. Uh, also, you have you know different situations here, and so it's a balance somewhere in between. Furious Republicans are going to pin the Wade Davis Manifesto, which accused the president of usurping power and using the remitted states to ensure his reelection. What stopped them from passing that? Well, this little guy named John Wilkes Booth and all of his friends got together and developed this whole plan between the cronies to assassinate four people, and Lincoln was the only one that was successfully killed. So when that happened, Andrew Johnson becomes the president. Who was this man? Oh, he lacked presidential virtue. He was a provincial bigot. He gave his inaugural address drunk, as we've said. He was an advocate of small farmers. He himself had been a small farmer in Tennessee. Radicals thought Johnson was one of them, but he was not. He believed in a strict adherence to the Constitution and belief in limited government. He preferred the term restoration to reconstruction. Like Lincoln, he said there was no reconstruction because the states had not left the Union. So he excluded, with this proclamation of amnesty and reconstruction, not only the ones Lincoln excluded, but everyone who owned over $20,000 worth of taxable property. Those who were excluded might have to appeal especially to the president for a pardon. And before the year was out, he had issued 13,000 pardons. So let's talk about his plan. In each state, a native unionist was put as the provincial governor with the authority to call a convention of men elected by loyal voters. State conventions should invalidate the secession ordinance, abolish slavery, repudiate all Confederate debts, and each state had to ratify the 13th Amendment, which, just a reminder, ended slavery or declared that slavery was forever done. December 1865, Congress found the new state government, the post-war South, like the old ones, the new state government passed the Black Codes, restricting the freedoms of African Americans. While they varied from state to state, some provisions were common and existing marriages were recognized. Testimony of African Americans was accepted in legal cases involving other African Americans. African Americans could now own property and they were required to enter into annual labor contracts. Notice required there. They also set up a joint commission on reconstruction to gather evidence of Southern efforts to thwart reconstruction. There were many constitutional questions about reconstruction. Most Republicans converged on the forfeited rights theory, which later embodied in the report of the Joint Committee of Reconstruction. In 1866, Johnson's power and influence are going to greatly wane. He challenged Congress when he vetoed a bill to extend the life of the Freedmen's Bureau. Radical Republicans passed the Civil Rights Act as a response to the Black Coats. <coughs> Johnson was absolutely furious and said that granting citizenship to native-born African Americans exceeded the scope of the federal power. The 14th Amendment passes in June 1866 and goes far beyond the Civil Rights Act that they tried to pass in response that it reaffirmed the states and federal citizens of persons born are naturalized in the U.S. So this guaranteed citizenship for African Americans at that time, which is going to be huge. Now, the race riots erupted in Memphis and New Orleans as hundreds of African Americans were murdered in response to the Civil Rights Act. So Johnson goes out and gives what becomes known as his swing around the circle speech, where he blames the Republicans for the violence. As he travels across the country, he land blasted anyone who opposed his ideas, and he actually persuaded many people to vote against his party, not for it. So let's talk about the changes, or as we call it, congressional reconstruction. The first Reconstruction Act of March of 1867 brought about military reconstruction, which carved the South into five military districts, each governed by a Union general. Congress declared martial law and sent to peace and protect African Americans. All states had to draft a new constitution that ratified the 14th Amendment and provide suffrage to African Americans. Um, 
Republicans passed the second Reconstruction Act, which placed Union troops in charge of voter registration. Congress overrode two, count them, two presidential vetoes to pass these bills. The 15th Amendment guaranteed the right for African American males ratification of its uh, prerequisite for all Southern states still awaiting readmission. The 15th Amendment also had enfranchisement of poor Southern white males who had been restricted due to the lack of property ownership. The passage of the 15th Amendment had an enormous effect on the Women's Suffrage Amendment because many of the women who worked for African American rights had also wanted the right to vote as well and they felt betrayed. Southern African Americans flocked to vote at first. By the beginning of 1866, more than 700,000 freedmen had signed up as Republicans. Black political power is going to rise up as African American civic societies and grassroots political organizations sprouted up everywhere. Most were led by those who had been free blacks before the war. Black voters dominated the electorate across the South and elected many African American politicians to state legislatures. Johnson is going to lose power, though. Congress passed bills in 1867 to limit his power. The first was the Tenure Office Act, which sought to protect Republicans within the Johnson administration by forbidding their dismissal. And the second had to do with his right to fire Southern officials or to fire military officials. Now, finishing up with Johnson, let's talk about where he is going to go from here. So Congress is going to impeach him. Yes, they impeach President Johnson and they bring him in and they try him. And it comes all the way down to one vote. One vote is all the last being removed. Now, because he was not removed, basically everybody kind of chills out a little bit. So let's talk about the politics that are going to follow that. Shortly after Johnson, you are going to see the election of Ulysses S. Grant. He's the obvious choice. Why? Congress hated Johnson. Grant was this popular war hero. He eagerly received gifts and money in the North for his service, and he waved the bloody shirt, or his slogan, vote as you shot. Democrats, uh, Democrats opposed him with the New York governor, Horatio Seymour. Grant wins 213 electoral votes to 80 for Seymour, but he only wins the popular vote by around 300,000, which considering the estimate of registered African-Americans who voted was between 500 and 700,000, it's most likely that Grant owes his popular vote win to these people. Initially, he had some positive ideas. He passed the anti Klan law, although it was unconstitutional, and he held suspected Klan members, not convicted or charged Klan members, but people thought to possibly be involved with the Klan without trial. That is taking away your right of habeas corpus. Uh, during his first term, he silences the Klan, but Scandal takes away his success. So let's talk about some things that happened during Grant's administration. First, the Fisk Gould scandal. This had to do with Grant's brother-in-law driving um, with stock gold prices going skyward. He convinces Grant to sell off this gold and it's going to be bought off by this guy named Fisk, who was a, or excuse me, Gold, who was a friend of Fisk. Fisk was Grant's brother-in-law. Grant did nothing crooked here. He didn't really realize what was happening, but it was kind of a dumb choice. It makes him look really bad. Let's talk about political machines and bosses. This is where you see the tweed ring is in full swing with bribery and graft during elections. Graft is where you're stealing money. Tweed managed to get people placed by using immigrant votes to get his people elected. And then when you're elected, he had expectations for you. It was part of the tweed ring or Tammany Hall. Uh, he stole 20, or excuse me, 200 million in seven years from New York City. New York attorney Samuel Tilden manages to put Tweed in jail, but Tweed escapes, and Tilden's name's going to come back shortly. The Credit Mobile scandal. The Union Pacific Railroad Company formed the Credit Mobile Construction Company that was paying back 348% dividends to its stockholders. In other words, much more than it should because its stockholders were key congressmen. Even the vice president was involved in manipulating the stock market. Ooh. Not good. The whiskey ring, 1874 to 1875. It was found that members of Congress, members of even Grant staff, all sorts of people were involved in taking bribes to keep people from being charged with illegally producing liquor. Grant said, let no guilty escape. And then he turned around and he pardoned his secretary. So that wasn't. All right, so the election of Grant in 1872, Americans are disgusted with Grant. In fact, the Republican Party, not real happy with him. However, he's popular in a lot of circles, despite his bad choices. And the Democrat picked the guy Horatio Greeley, if you remember, an atheist. 
American beard eating communist free lover vegetarian who co signed Jefferson Davis's bond bill. Really? That's the best choice you had, but it is what it is. The economic crash of 1873, due to unbridled capitalism, um, capitalist expansion, we're going to see more track lay than needed, uh, overmining factories, and that that the market needed is not going to go well. And so we're going to see a lot of issues here. Many people are going to be put out of business by big business. This is where big business really gets their name. 15,000 businesses went bankrupt. New York City unemployment battled or unemployed battled the police. African Americans were definitely hit the hardest during this. Uh, money problems during the war, $450 million of folding paper money was issued. 1868, 100 million was removed from circulation in paper money. This is trying to cause deflation. And deflation messes over who? Well, let's talk about that. The Farmers, yes. Anybody who is selling does not want the price to drop. Anybody who is selling wants inflation. Agrarian and debtor groups wanted cheap money. If you're paying back your debt, you want in, you want inflation. So describe uh, basically getting that idea is important. Grant vetoed a bill to print more money. Your silverites were people who wanted a 1 to 16 ratio paid for silver, and they wanted silver to be coined in 1873. It's another scheme for inflation. Long story short, it doesn't really work out at this point, but we'll talk about silver later. So both of your parties this time are based on patronage. That means people are supporting the people who their families have been supporting for a long time. The lifeblood of both parties at this time is based on that. You have kickbacks are going to be given to the people who work for you. You have stalwarts. Stalwarts are going to embrace your civil service positions. You have half-breeds. These are people who kind of flirt with reform but still take the jobs. And then you have the others. So Grant wants to run again, but they're like, no, no, two terms, buddy, two terms. That's all we, we got for you, two terms. So the election of 1876, the Democrats are going to run Samuel Tilden, the guy we just talked about from New York who captured Boss Tweed, put him in jail, way to go. And the Republicans run Rutherford B. Hayes, whose best thing is his, he was the governor from Ohio, and his nickname is the Great Unknown, because that's what we want as our president, is the Great Unknown. But anyway... So, Tilden gets 184 of the 185 needed votes. There were 20 unaccounted votes in four states. Remember, Electoral College is how you get elected, not popular vote, as we've seen in more than one election. So, the Constitution says the electoral, electoral return, if not clear, if there's not a clear winner, will be sent to Congress. And so, the deadlock is broken by the Compromise of 1877, the Electoral Count Act, 15-member committee. Senate, House, Supreme Court members, eight Republicans, seven Democrats. So, of course, the group with a larger number, you win. It just is what it is. However, Hayes is going to take office, but if he does, the South has said, we shall rebel again. And so they're like, yeah, we're not doing that. And so what the Republicans are going to do, who had sided with African Americans, who had protected, who had worked to protect them and to put them into society, they are going to take that military that has been occupying the South out. They take it out. Yeah. They sell them down river. They let them go. They sell off the rights for African Americans that they had worked so hard to gain. And that's where we will leave. I'll talk to you later. I hear a little boy and a dog. Ah.